Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. One of the most highly recognizable animals in the world is the chimpanzee of Africa. Because of its appeal when young, it has frequently been captured for the pet trade. And as a human model, it has often been captured for biomedical research. For these reasons and loss of habitat, it is declining in the wild. However, as they grow, Captive chimpanzees often become unmanageable, whether in a home or in a research laboratory. As a result, they sometimes wind up in a zoo or become a subject of euthanasia. Now, a new option is available. Here, in the Gambia, West Africa, 12 miles from the capital city of Banjul, is the Abuko Nature Reserve, where captive chimpanzees, both young and adult, are being returned to the wild. Our special report today, the first of two parts, takes us to the Gambia where younger chimps are being trained and next week to where adult training occurs. A huge cage has been constructed at the Abuko Nature Reserve where the larger chimps are contained during the training period. The fundamental elements of survival, which were never learned by these chimps, are being taught to them now in a very comprehensive program by Janice Carter a psychology graduate student of the University of Oklahoma. These three chimps are the youngest of those that Janice has here at the Abuko Nature Reserve. To accustom them to their new life, they are each day taken out into different areas. During this period, she furthers their education in how to survive when they are permanently free. How long a shimp remains here depends largely on the individual shimp's background. In the wild, chimpanzees are exposed to the necessary survival skills through close contact with their mother and other members of their social group. Captive reared chimps and young wild caught chimps are deprived of this opportunity to learn. And so they must be taught the essential skills such as how to find food and water, how and where to build nests, how to recognize and avoid predators, and even how to communicate with another chimpanzee. These young chimps are fortunate in that they are beginning their rehabilitation process at a young age when learning is easier. Later we will see adult chimps which face a far more difficult task in returning to a wild life. Lakey, the most recent addition, is four years old and has more wild experience than the others. She was illegally brought into the Gambia six weeks ago and was confiscated a mile from this reserve. The Gambia has strict laws prohibiting owning or trafficking in wild animals. Lily is five and has been here for eight months. Dash, nearly five, has been here a year after having been confiscated from a trader. Lakey and her companions are only allowed to roam the reserve under supervision. They're kept under protective cover at night. These chimps have undergone problems during previous captivity, and it's necessary they build trust in me and in each other. The trauma suffered by many of the chimps before they get here is often severe, both physically and psychologically. Sometimes it's almost irreparable. Re-educating them to survival in the wild is often a long process. Gradually, depending upon the individual, they grow more secure. All of these chimps have a very strong need for social bonds. Physical contact is extremely important. While first I must establish a very close social bond with them, I must also gradually wean them of dependence upon me. It's a delicate situation and cannot be rushed. The bond must be strong, yet not so important to them that they become unable to revert to the wild. Lily, raised in a home, is more accustomed to humans and therefore requires more contact with me to renew self-confidence. 
She requires this individual treatment more than either Dash or Lacey. Gradually, all the chimps here overcome the need for such individual human assurance and begin assuming their own identity in the group. As this occurs, my playing with them will diminish and their interactions with one another will increase. The sad thing is, of course, that any of them were removed from their natural habitat in the first place. However cute they may appear to be when young, they eventually become unmanageable. But by that time, the damage has been done. Part of the training lies in introducing these chimps to the other animals sharing their habitat. This tame, hand-reared bush buck has learned to accept the chimps and is not alarmed by Lily's approach. Few animals here are this harmless, so the chimps must quickly learn which might be dangerous and how to avoid them. Each day, the chimps are taught new lessons and see new territory. By stages, they begin to develop greater confidence in their own abilities, learning from one another, in many cases, just as they learn from Janice. Amid the different types of vegetation in this reserve, she's been introducing them to new experiences daily. The more they have an opportunity to react to new stimuli, the sooner they develop self-sufficiency. Janice will take them now to an area they've not seen before where they can be exposed to some new foods. One of the most important things Janice Carter teaches the chimps is finding food. To do this, she must take them into areas of natural habitat and act as an example for them in locating, pointing out, and eating food so they will learn how to get food when they're eventually on their own. It's important to remember that often the chimps brought to a buco for rehabilitation have had limited experience in foraging for food. They must therefore first of all learn the most elementary aspects of wild survival. On introducing them to proper food, Janice must articulate actual shimp food grunts. These sounds assure the inexperienced shimps that it is good to eat. My tasting the netto blossom and making mouth-to-mouth -mouth contact with the chimps is very important. It emulates food sharing by chimps in the wild, especially between mother and young. Already, Dash has reacted to my food grunting and has accepted the idea of this new food source. Even with the example set, Lily is still reluctant to try it on her own until Lakey's climbing provides more inspiration. Lily's self-confidence will grow with repeated efforts. Lily's problem is that when she was kept as a pet, her owners pampered her considerably. And so, adjustment back to wild existence is very difficult for her. She was far more accustomed to domestic fruits like apples, pears, and oranges. The chimps have accepted the netto. This is a big step, because these fruits will be important in their diet when they are on their own. Even in feeding, social interaction among chimps is frequent and important. As well as netto being available to the chimps in this area, there is also a fruit called tamba. It is important that Janice introduces it to them also, showing by her own actions 
that it is a natural food for them. On each of these feeding excursions, she collects a number of these fruits, as well as others, and carries them to the larger shimps still in their cages, so that they too have a chance to become familiarized with indigenous fruits. Her demonstrating how to eat is supplemented by showing them as well how food grows so they will eventually be able to recognize and gather it in the wild. Trying to pressure chimps to learn doesn't work, so they more or less at the pace of their own instruction. Ample time must always be allowed for play. In all activities, I am constantly making my own actions a model for them to follow. Often, they seem to ignore me. Only later to imitate the exact actions I was making for them when I thought they were not paying attention. When Lakey and Dash wrestle like this, it's hard to believe that Dash was gravely ill from the effects of his captivity when he first came here. His recuperation took several months, yet now he is probably the most active of the three. Dash and his two companions represent much of the promise of the rehabilitation project. One of the problems at the Abuco Nature Reserve is the lack of accessible water, especially during the dry season, as now. Therefore, Janice carries water along with them. At least four hours of training activities each day makes them all thirsty. In the second stage of their training, they will have access to plenty of natural water. Then, Janice will teach them how and where to drink more naturally than this. The problem is that the only available surface water here is at a place called Bamboo Pool, which is inhabited by crocodiles. They aren't taken there until Janice feels they're more skilled in recognizing and avoiding dangers. Although the shimps watch Janice closely and are interested in anything she has or does, she still tries as much as possible to isolate herself from them. Sometimes that's almost impossible, for often they need comforting and reassurance. Nevertheless, in the area they're heading for now, an important example of their growing skill and independence will become apparent. Part of the training of the shimps is teaching them to make nests of leaves, but they cannot be rushed into it. The training must come in a natural progression of events, with ample time for rest and play, and the satisfaction of their curiosity. Lily, for example, has become very interested in Janice Carter's hair. Grooming has a very important social function and Lily has now switched her attention to my eye. As she gently and carefully cleans my eye corners, the motions of her mouth are indicative of her concentration. Grooming may have been experienced by each of these chimps before captivity. Perhaps some memory of it remains. Often the chimps make movements or play gestures, such as Lily is doing now, which indicate that these may be actions the chimps observed in the wild when they were younger. These chimps need to establish a strong, lasting bond between them for when they are on their own. 
In this early stage, my presence becomes a focal point for them, which encourages them to interact around me. This, in turn, helps them to form a tight social group. Living and learning together has great rewards, but while it may appear to be easy or fun for both the Shimps and Janus, it is difficult and sometimes even dangerous. That's particularly true concerning the older Shimps, which are much harder to handle than these and which have more difficulty in learning. Physical contact in many forms is very important to their rehabilitation development. This sort of shoving play between Janice and Lily stimulates trust and strengthens bonds. The example it sets is emulated by Lakey and Dash, tightening the bond between them. While play constitutes much of the activity, even that sometimes ends abruptly and more serious activity is engaged in. In this case, Lily brings back a branch and immediately the others seem aware of her intent and join in. Lily has decided to make a nest in the manner I have been teaching them. Leafy branches are gathered to form a rough circle on the ground and the branches are bent back, held down with a foot and interwoven into a loose structure. Instruction begins as a game, but the chimps will soon learn the purpose of the nest. There is good reason to believe that the compulsion for nest building may have instinctive origins. Still, it takes practice and observation on the part of the chimp to perfect the actual nest building skill. Whatever the case, it would seem that nest building is a combination of both instinct and learned behavior. It is gratifying to see that close by, Dash is similarly building a rather good nest of his own on the ground. Wild chimps sometimes build day nests on the ground like this, but their nighttime nests are invariably in trees as protection against predators. <coughs> Having had more wild experience, Lakey shows a higher degree of performance by building hers in a tree. Soon, the others will follow that example. For now, Lily is quite content with her handiwork, as well as its proximity to me. None of the nests made here are ideal, but Lakey at least does attempt to use hers appropriately, and her effort has certainly been commendable. The lessons for this day are over, and it's time Janice returns these shimps to their cage. In the months that they have been here, learning and practicing the fundamental skills they must have in order to survive, the shimps have made great strides. It has been necessary for Janice to be more than merely a tutor to the shimps.
Throughout the training here, she has kept close records of the shrimp's progress, behavior, health, and other data, which will be of benefit later in further projects of this type. The chances of these shrimps will only improve as they undergo phase two of the rehabilitation program. It is Janice's plan to release them as a group, along with her four larger ones, on a new national park island many miles from here, up the Gambia River. This has been the last walk for these chimps in Abuko Nature Reserve. They have learned all they can here and have now completed the first stage of their rehabilitation. The next time I take them from this cage, it will be to release them into the wild. The work of Janice Carter in rehabilitating shimps provides them the knowledge for survival. What we've seen at the Abuko Nature Reserve is the first part of a two-part project. If the shimps were simply released into the wild with no further concern, their chances for survival would still be slim. That's why the second part of the rehabilitation project is so important. Next week, We'll see how Janice Carter takes the re-educated young shimps far up the Gambia River to Baboon Island to be released. With them will be the very famous shimp named Lucy, who learned how to communicate with humans in American Sign Language for the Deaf. At Baboon Island, the shimps must form an appropriate social structure, as well as learn the rigorous requirements of survival in the Wild Kingdom.